During the break, someone was asking me about beta blockers for anxiety disorders. And beta blockers are only used for stage fright, which is performance anxiety. So this is a person who's just afraid of speaking in public, but every other aspect of their life is okay. And in that situation, you give them a beta blocker, small doses, and they have to take it half an hour before they have to speak in public. Not the night before, but half an hour before. And what that does is that it stops the external autonomic hyperactivity. Okay. Any other questions on schizophrenia? Someone else was asking me about when to use different kinds of therapy. And this is, there are hundreds of therapies that are out there today. For the purpose of this exam, you are not psychiatrists. Even in psychiatry boards, they're not big on asking you the 100,000 types of therapies that there are. But let me give you a general idea. Everyone in this room, including myself, would probably benefit from individual psychotherapy. Individual psychotherapy is we just sit down with a person and talk about their problems, try to resolve the issues that they went to see the psychiatrist for. If you're a substance abuser, the best type of therapy is group therapy. So for drugs, group therapy is always the way to go. Why? Because you need that constant support of the group. So if you come to my office and you say, you know, doc, yeah, I'm an alcoholic, but you know what? Alcohol didn't do much to my life. It didn't affect me in a bad way. What am I going to tell you? Wow, I'm going to have a lot of support. I'm going to say, hmm, think about that. Think about all the negative aspects that alcohol has affected your life. How, how much of an impact is that? Now, imagine the same scenario, the same man in a room in an AA meeting when he stands up and it's his turn to talk and he says, yeah, I'm an alcoholic, but you know what? Alcohol didn't do anything bad for me. What do you think the other people in the room are going to yell at that individual? You're going to hear it from everybody. And that, of course, has a much greater impact than if one little doctor says, hmm, think about the adverse consequences. Wow, that was really strong. But when you have a room full of people telling you that, not only that, they've experienced what you've experienced, the impact is always greater. So when it's drugs, group therapy is always the way to go. If you have a very sick patient, for example, the schizophrenic, it's supportive therapy, which is the mildest form of therapy. That's what I was telling you earlier. You try to build trust. You get the patient to trust you. You get the patient who trusts you, who then will tell you everything. You know what, doc? I stopped taking my medication. And that's what you're trying to build in supportive therapy. Anxiety disorders tend to get behavioral therapy. What is behavioral therapy? Relaxation techniques. For example, phobias relaxation techniques, systematic desensitizations, exposure, flooding. Those are therapies where you are proactive. You are doing something with the therapist to reduce your level of anxiety. So personality disorders, what kind of therapy do they get? Individual. Drug users get what? Group. Anxiety disorders get? Behavioral therapy. Really sick people get? supportive psychotherapy or people who have very mild disorders also get supportive psychotherapy if your husband died do I send you to psychoanalysis for the rest of your life or do I send you to supportive psychotherapy you go to supportive psychotherapy so if you have very mild symptoms supportive psychotherapy what if you're healthy but you've got a lot of symptoms that affect other people then maybe you benefit from psychoanalysis that's the other end you have to be really healthy to get psychoanalysis because you're going to go to an analyst three to five times a week basically for the rest of your life you're going to lie down that's the classic one that's what you the one you see in the cartoon where the patient is lying on the couch the analyst sits by the patient's head behind you so the patient doesn't even see him and that's in the cartoons what's typically the analyst doing either not in the room or drawing a cartoon or reading the funny pages or sleeping. I mean, that's the typical cartoon that you see. Hopefully that doesn't occur. But that's when you're healthy and you're able to talk about mother, you talk about your dreams. You basically do what's called free association. Whatever comes into your head, you talk about it. 
Why is that not good for a schizophrenic? Because every once in a while, the analyst will say something. Hmm, think about that. Now imagine a schizophrenic who's actively hallucinating, who you doesn't even forgets you're there, and all of a sudden hears a voice saying, hmm, think about that. That's not good for someone who's very sick. That's why psychoanalysis are for the healthy people. Does that help you a little bit? Okay, let's go to the next case. Uh, chief complaints are nausea and muscle cramps two days after surgery. 35-year-old actor is referred by a surgeon two days post-op. He's become irritable, is suffering from diarrhea, complains of muscle cramps, and nausea. He acknowledges occasional heroin use but denies that he is hooked on it, meaning he is addicted to it. Uh, his temperature is 37.9 or 100.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Pulse is 90. Blood pressure is 150 over 90. His pupils are dilated but equal and reactive to light. He's restless and irritable but coherent and oriented. He denies psychotic symptoms. He repeatedly verbalizes <coughs> excuse me, that he needs to go home and that the hospital is making him sick. Sure, the hospital is making him sick. Why? Because he's not getting his heroin. This is the best scenario for a substance withdrawal question. Chances are, if they're asking you a drug question, and it's a withdrawal question, it's going to be someone that's in the hospital, the alcoholic. And the typical scenario is that, someone who gets admitted, and a day or two days after admission develops all of these symptoms. Because what's going on in the hospital? You're not getting your alcohol, you're not getting your heroin, you're not getting the drug that your body is used to getting on a daily basis. And that's what you typically find in these withdrawal questions. So let's see here. I think this differential is pretty easy. What do you think this patient has? When we talk about drugs, we talk about four things. And this is true for every drug, except a few. You've got the withdrawal. So we fill in the blank, cocaine, withdrawal, heroin, withdrawal, alcohol, withdrawal. We also talk about intoxication. We talk about abuse, and we talk about dependence. And those are the four things they could ask you on the exam. Abuse, intoxication, withdrawal, and dependence. Now what you need to know is what are the differences between one and the other. What happens to us when we are intoxicated? What happens to us when we are in withdrawal? Because it is very common to get drug questions on the test and they want to know whether it's withdrawal, abuse, dependence, etc. So it could be opiate withdrawal, it could be opiate dependence, it could be polysubstance dependence, so you're either withdrawing from the heroin, you're dependent on the heroin, or you're dependent on several other drugs. But because he's only mentioned what so far? He's only mentioned how many drugs? One drug. We know that it's not poly. Poly means at least two or more. So what are the big differences between withdrawal and dependence? And we're going to get to that. But this individual did a tox screen. It was positive for opiates. Well, he told us he was on these drugs anyway. Let's do the... Okay. Let's talk about withdrawal and dependence and abuse and intoxication. Abuse and intoxication is not here, but I'm going to cover it anyway. <coughs> What's to be intoxicated from a drug? It means that your body, you have used a certain amount of drugs. And as a result of that drug use, you are going to develop or you're going to have certain maladaptive changes, whether they be behavioral or whether they be psychological. So you use a drug, something happens to you. Let's talk about alcohol intoxication. When we are drunk, if any of you have ever been drunk before, and I know no one here has ever been drunk, but I'm sure you have friends that have been drunk, what do your friends do when they are quote unquote drunk? Their speech is slurred, right? They become disinhibited, right? They have gait disturbances. When you see the cops pull them over, what does the cop try to do? They tend to have problems with their balance, so they try to make you touch your nose. They try to make you walk a straight line. I mean, this is what I've seen. These are the things that they do because alcohol intoxication gives you all of those problems. 
Legal alcohol intoxication for the purpose of the test is what? It's 0.1% or 100 milligrams per deciliter of blood alcohol level. Even though some states go to 0 0.08, most of the states do not have that. Remember a few years ago in Congress, they tried to pass that, but the alcohol lobby was so strong that they decided against it. So for the purpose of the exam, legal intoxication is still 100 or 0.1%. So intoxication is you use a drug, this is what happens to you. Let's talk about cocaine intoxication. When you use cocaine, what happens to you? Remember cocaine uses dopamine. It uses the dopamine tracks. So dopamine goes up. What do you get? Paranoia, suspiciousness. You think people are out to get you. You think people want to hurt you. You think people want to kill you. So it resembles what? Schizophrenia, paranoid type. Opiate intoxication. What is it that you look for in the test for opiate intoxication, opiate overdose? Besides the confusion, the slurred speech, the constipation, the dead giveaway or the clue, the biggest clue for you is going to be, you're going to look at the patient's eyes and what are you going to see? Pinpoint pupils. When you see pinpoint pupils, you know you're dealing with heroin, the overdose intoxication, basically. And it's a triad, pinpoint pupils, respiratory depression, or even coma or death. So can you die from opiate overdose? Yes. Um, PCP intoxication, for example, fencyclidine, also called angel dust. PCP intoxication makes you very violent, and that's going to be your clue for the test. Someone comes in, destroys an emergency room, or needs a lot of cops to bring them in, that is, think number one, PCP. LSD intoxication, the hallucinogens. What does LSD give you? It gives you hallucinations. It gives you depersonalization, derealization, visual distor distortion. These are the patients that stand outside their balcony and start to do this. Because what happens? They think they can fly. And they jump and they start to do this, but it doesn't help them because they go splat. So that's what you find in LSD intoxication. Now, so is intoxication clear? What about abuse? What is it to be abusing a substance? For you to be an abuser of a substance, you also have a maladaptive pattern of use. So that every time you use, you get in trouble. You put yourself in situations that are dangerous. And you keep using no matter what. So if you drink alcohol only on weekends, but every time you drink, you get drunk, every time you drink, you get drunk, you drive, and every time, <coughs> excuse me, you drink, you get drunk, you drive, you get pulled over, could you have a diagnosis of alcohol abuse? Yes. I don't care if you function from Monday through Friday. If every Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night, this is what you're doing, you meet the criteria because you keep using, you're getting yourself in trouble, and you're putting yourself in dangerous situations. Now let's talk about withdrawal. What is the basic definition of a withdrawal? Withdrawal is nothing more than your body's or your brain's way of telling you, give me more. It typically occurs when you either A, reduce the dose, or B, stop the drug altogether. If you're an alcoholic, and you're used to having four bottles of, of wine a day. Four bottles. But today you only have one bottle of wine. You drank alcohol. Can you go into alcohol withdrawal? What do you think? Most definitely. So if I just reduce it, I can go in withdrawal. If I stop it altogether, of course, I can go in withdrawal. When you're hungry, what does your stomach do? <coughs> does your stomach growl? You are in food withdrawal, if you want to call it that. So what is your stomach doing to you? It's telling you to, feed me, feed me, I'm hungry. Same thing applies for these drugs. So the body makes it in such a way that most of these withdrawals are really uncomfortable because that way we break down and we give the body what it wants. So let's talk about alcohol withdrawal. When people stop or reduce the amount of alcohol, 
What do you look for in the test? Tremors is your clue. And remember I told you where these things typically occur. Where do they occur? Hospital. Look for hospital settings. So the patient starts to shake. The patient can have hallucinations. The patients can have seizures. And ultimately, what do the patients experience? Delirium tremens. So the patients can have DTs. So therefore, any patient that in the case you learn has a history of alcohol abuse and they get admitted into the hospital for whatever reason, for surgery, to get a bunion removed, I don't care what they're being admitted for, is that a patient who could theoretically go into withdrawal while in the hospital? Yes. So any patient will always get the following medications. What do you give these people? Always give them thiamine. Why do you give them thiamine first? Because that way you will not, or you will prevent what? The Wernickes. You also give them multivitamins. You also give them folic acid. Thiamine, multivitamins, folic acid, and you also use a benzodiazepine, either a three-day or a five-day. It depends what protocol you're using. The most commonly used is chlordiazepoxide, Librium. What other facilities use is oxazepam. And why oxazepam? Because it basically bypasses the liver. So it might be a little bit safer. It doesn't matter what you use. What you do is that you start giving them the benzo, and then every day you reduce the dose of the benzo so that by the third or the fifth day, you're not on any of the benzodiazepine. And why does this only go for five days, tops? Because typically DTs does not occur after the fifth day. It can occur, but most of the patients who experience delirium tremens will do so anywhere between two to four days of stopping the drug use. Now, who's more likely to get delirium tremens? What do you think? People who, have people who are chronic alcoholics, so at least three to five years of heavy drinking, big-time heavy hitters, are more prone to get DTs. Or people who are medically debilitated. The sicker you are, the more likely that you'll have DTs. Or you've had DTs in the past. So you've had it in the past, it's likely that you could get it in the future. And one of the prodromas of DTs that could be a clue for you is nightmares. These patients will have an increase of nightmares, so you have to be careful with that because that's something that they like to ask on the test. Now, delirium tremens, of course, you're going to get blood pressure changes, you get seizures, you get delirium. So you basically have a clouding of your sensorium. Is it lethal? Yes. So since you can die from DTs, what you do is that you try to prevent it by using the drugs that I was telling you. The benzos, the thiamine, the folic acid, the multivitamin. That's standard for anybody that you know has a history of alcohol abuse. So that's alcohol withdrawal. So your body was giving you the, the seizures and everything else to make sure that you drank more. What's opiate withdrawal? Opiate withdrawal will resemble flu-like symptoms, and that's your clue flu-like. When we have a flu, what do we get? We get fever, we get chills, we get nausea, we get vomiting, we get muscle aches, we have lacrimation, runny nose, which is rhinorrhea, uh, piloerection, sweating, and of course we could get insomnia. You also get muscle spasms. Have you heard the term kick the habit? You know where that came from? from the muscle spasms of heroin, people in heroin withdrawal, so it's as if though they're kicking, and that's where the term kick the habit comes from. And that's the definition of withdrawal, and I'm going to get to the treatment of that in a bit. How do we treat opiate withdrawal? I told you how to treat alcohol withdrawal. How do we treat opiate withdrawal? Since opiate, we're going to use two treatments. Now, the question will be, is it acute treatment or long-term treatment? In a hospital, how many hospitals do you know have methadone in the uh, pharmacy? Do you know of a lot of hospitals that have methadone in the pharmacy? Some hospitals do, other hospitals don't, but what's the problem of just giving a patient methadone? A lot of times, these patients come in on weekends. And what happens to a lot of these methadone clinics on weekends? They're closed. So you have a patient who you know is on heroin or on methadone, I should say, or heroin or whatever, and you ask them, how much methadone are you on? Because now while you're in the hospital, I'm going to have to give you methadone. 
How many of you are going to trust the patient? What do you think the patient is going to say? Oh, I'm on a million milligrams of hero of uh, methadone a day. You know that's going to be a lie. So what's a better alternative? Give them a drug that reduces the symptoms, but it's not an opiate-like drug. What drug am I talking about? Clonidine. So acutely, you suppress the symptoms of withdrawal by giving them clonidine. Long term, you're going to put the patient on methadone and slowly taper the dose until the patient is off of these medications. So clonidine and methadone is how to treat opiate withdrawal. Let's talk about, um, let's see, what other withdrawals? Those are the big ones for the test. Heroin, opiates, cocaine withdrawal. What do you think happens to you in cocaine withdrawal? If when you use cocaine you're up, what happens when you stop or remove the cocaine or reduce the cocaine? You come down. So what do you get? Dysphoric mood. You have changes in your appetite. You have sleep disturbances. So what do you think happens? You have thoughts about suicide. So cocaine withdrawal resembles what? It resembles major depression. So your biggest concern is making sure that this patient, you assess them clearly for suicide. <coughs> so a good picture of withdrawal. See the difference? So there we go. We treat with clonidine or methadone. Let's talk about opiate dependence. What is it to be dependent on a drug? To be dependent on a drug is that, first of all, you have tolerance. What's tolerance? Where you use more and more of the drug to get the same effect. If your body is craving more and the more of the drug, what do you think happens when you try to stop the drug? Is your body going to react? Yes. And what do we call that? Withdrawal. So what else happens? You keep using more in larger amounts. You've tried to cut down. You spend all time in things related to drugs. You only hang out with your druggy friends. You only do things related to drug use. So your family, your friends, your work, now everything about your life is affected. And not only that, you keep using despite knowing that every aspect of your life is affected. <coughs> and that's what dependence is all about. So if we're thinking of abuse versus dependence, which one do you think is a bigger picture? Dependence is the much bigger picture. Can abuse lead to dependence? Of course it can. You can be an abuser but still not be dependent on it. When you keep using where you have tolerance, you have withdrawal, and every aspect of your life is affected, your wife left you, your husband left you, they fired you from work, then you know that the answer is dependence. And how do we treat dependence? That's when we send the patients to drug programs. We send them to programs, whether it's 28 days or, or three months or six months or a year. It depends, of course, on your financial situations, as is true for everything. And what do you do in these dependent programs? Or I'm sorry, not in dependent programs. <coughs> in these rehab programs, what you try for these patients to do is to learn what's called relapse prevention skills. How to make sure that they do not go back to their drug using days. So for example, if you only have friends that are drug users, spend all day using drugs, all you do is talk about drugs, and every waking hour of their day they're buying drugs, what would be a relapse prevention technique for you? Do you need new friends or do you go back to those friends? You get new friends. So you're trying to learn ways so that you don't go back to drug use. So everything that made you use drugs, you try to stop. So you try to find triggers. A lot of people use drugs because of anxiety, because of depression. So you make sure that you're treating these things. Therefore, you stop them going back to their drug use. As far as inpatient to outpatient programs, they're both just as effective. The only way you make a decision, inpatient versus outpatient, is you have to figure out on the case itself that they give you. If this is a patient who's motivated, who's compliant, who's eager to change, who's got a good support system, a family that cares about him or her, which one would be your first referral, inpatient or outpatient? What do you think? And the patient wants to continue with his life. Would you feel comfortable sending them to an outpatient program? Yes. 
What if you have a patient who's got no support, no family, has failed numerous outpatient programs, then what could be your next choice? Then you would send that patient to an inpatient program. But are they just as effective? Yes, they are. But if you have to choose which one's better, which one do you think would be better? As far as the control of the patient, making sure the patients doesn't, don't use or anything like that, you know that an inpatient, because everything is going to be controlled. The patient sleeps there, the patient wakes up there, the patient does everything there. It doesn't mean that they can't use because they do escape and use drugs. And remember, treatment and all of these things for drugs is always voluntary. Because the first thing that's essential in drug users is that they need to understand that they have a problem. So they have to overcome their denial, accept that there's something wrong, and then they go into the programs. If you're in one of these programs and you say, you know what, I want to leave, you know what they're going to tell you? There's the door. You leave whenever you want to. If you don't want to be here, you don't have to be here. Uh, polysubstance is you're going to use at least three of the drugs over a 12-month period. And, of course, if you do a urine tox screen, you know it's going to be positive for those things. So let's go back to what do you think he has? Let's go back to the case and review it. He was in the hospital, he developed symptoms, and he says that he's not hooked on it. The fact that you stop the drug and you develop symptoms, what do we call that? Withdrawal or dependence? This is withdrawal. So what's his final diagnosis? Opiate withdrawal. Because it doesn't tell us anything about work. It doesn't tell us anything about how he spends his day. It doesn't tell us anything about tolerance. It doesn't tell us anything about anything else. So it's only withdrawal. Um, is this okay? Okay. Other drugs that I didn't mention, and we might as well go over them now. Let's review the drugs. If they mention paranoia, what's your answer? Cocaine what? intoxication or overdose if they mention depression or the patient looks depressed what is your answer cocaine withdrawal if they mention violence severe violence what's your answer PCP intoxication if they mention flashbacks which I didn't mention but if they mention flashbacks it's LSD the hallucinogens a flashback is you're not using the drugs now but you experience the same thing you did when you were experiencing the drug. If they mention something bad happening, what's the drug that's the worst kind of drug? Barbiturates. That's why they're rarely used. So death, shock, something awful happening to you, it's probably a barbiturate question. If they mention seizures, everybody knows that alcoholics have seizures, but not everybody knows that what produces seizures? Benzodiazepine withdrawal. So if they mention seizures, it's probably a benzodiazepine withdrawal question. And typically they like to give you someone who's young, someone who stops using a drug, and then all of a sudden they develop anxiety, can't sleep, and a seizure disorder. Or a seizure, I should say. What are benzos used for? Anxiety and insomnia. So you stop it, what do you get? Everything that you were being treated for. Okay. Are we breaking here? Did I pass? No. Okay. Um, chief complaint is I'm worried about the cleanliness and safety of my food. A 30-year-old woman reports that for the past two years, following a bad case of diarrhea for which she was hospitalized for a week, she's been scared of being sick again and has become very meticulous about ensuring that the food she eats are safe and clean. She says that it started with her washing vegetables and fruits at least three times before consuming. How many of you do that? Confess now. How many of you do that? It's normal. This is what makes, this is the difference between a true disorder and features of a disorder. I'm sure that when you read about psych, you say to yourself, oh, I think I have a little bit of this, and I know I have a little bit of that, and I know I have a little bit of that. So we find features of ourselves in everything. Now, what makes it a disorder is that 
those features are strong enough to affect your life. It affects your social life, your occupational life. It affects every aspect of your living. If that's the case, then you know the patient has a disorder. Let's assume that this woman washes her vegetables ten times. I don't care. But she goes out. She doesn't worry about anything else. Does she have OCD because she washes her vegetables ten times? No, she has features of it. But this woman is completely different. Um, it then progressed to her having to sterilize the silverware she uses before meals to bringing her own silverware when she goes out to eat. Did you see the movie As Good As It Gets with Jack Nicholson? What did he do in that movie? He couldn't eat in a regular restaurant. He only would be able to eat at one restaurant and with that only one waitress. And not only was it only that restaurant with that waitress, but he would have to bring his own utensils. Remember, he'd bring them. I think they were little plastic forks and knives, and he'd bring them wrapped in a little bag, and that was the only way that he could eat. And if you just so happened to have touched his fork or knife, what would he do? He'd throw them away, and he'd leave the restaurant because he couldn't eat. Now, is that symptom affecting his life? Did it affect Jack Nicholson's life? Definitely. Then you know you have a disorder. Is this behavior of this woman affecting her life? Has she stopped going out? Is it affecting her ability to go out? Yes. She's worried that it's beginning to affect her relationships. I got ahead of you. Because she's now concerned about food that she did not personally prepare, and this has forced her to stay at home. She turns down invitations to hang out with friends or to go out on dates. So now let me ask the question again. I kind of went ahead. Is this woman's symptoms affecting her life? Most definitely. So does she have the disorder? Yes. Now, physical exam, of course, is normal, except for dry and chapped skin on both hands. Let's think about differentials. Honestly, there's no other differential here. If you know psychiatry, you know what this is. Could this be anything medical? And don't tell me a tumor affecting a specific area of the brain, which could produce OCD-like symptoms. Can it occur? Yes. But is that what you're going to look for on the test? No, psychosurgery is not the treatment of choice here. So what's your big differential? We've got OCD, and we've got the personality disorder, and we've got delusional disorder, and we've got phobia. Oops. Okay. But the two big ones here for you, which is the ones that you tend to confuse the most, are obsessive-compulsive disorder and obsessive-compulsive personality disorder. Now, if you truly know the differences, it should not be a problem, but typically most do not, so that's why it gets so confusing. And we're going to get to these in a second. Do we need to do any tests for these people, people who have anxiety disorders? This one, do we need to do anything? Are there any lab tests that tells us whether she has OCD? Nothing here. So there's nothing to do. Let's move on. Okay, what's OCD? As you know, it's an anxiety disorder affects men and women equally and what they have is obsessions and or compulsions which means you can have obsessions alone or you can have compulsions alone but most people have what both obsessions and a compulsion what's an obsession an obsession is nothing more than a thought that's it it's thoughts that you have all day it's thoughts which are recurrent which is the same thought it's persistent and they increase anxiety so therefore, they are ego dystonic, meaning you're not happy with these thoughts. You know that you truly don't think like this. If you have thoughts all day that you know are not true, you know you don't want to do, but you can't control them, how would that affect your level of anxiety? What do you think happens? It tends to go up. Let me give you a little example, and I always like this example. How many of you have ever been to a party at night outside and it's someone's house where they have a pool in the yard. But it's not a pool party. It's a party outside where the pool is. How many of you have been standing by the pool talking to someone, and all of a sudden you get this thought that says, wow, what would happen if I pushed this person in the water? <laughs> How many of you have had those thoughts? Be honest now. For a second, a second, you just had it, but you know you'd never do it because you're not going to be very friendly, popular, I should say, if you were to do that. 
But how many of you have the thought? That's a thought that we all experience. Or if you're driving your car and someone in a bike pulls up next to you, how many of you for a second say, wow, I'm just tempted to like push him off or like hit him with my car or something? How many of you want to do that? It happens. Or if you're standing in line and someone bends to pick something up. <laughs> that's the big one. How many of you are tempted to like kick them or grab them or do whatever? That is what an obsession is. It's all it is. It's a thought that goes in your head, but the problem with them versus us, assuming none of you have OCD, is that for us, the thought goes in, the thought goes out. For them, the thought goes in, stays in every day of their lives. So think of how difficult and frustrating OCD is. Then that's followed by compulsion, which is nothing more than an act. It's a ritual that we're performing, which lowers the anxiety, which is time-consuming, which is repetitive, which is also ego-dystonic, meaning we're not happy with it. So if you think that you've gotten dirty, what would that do? It raises your level of anxiety. Well, what's going to calm that? I'm going to go and wash my hands. And that's what the compulsion is all about. Now, the individual recognizes that this is excessive or unreasonable. Do you see this patient, the case, the woman in the case, having this? Is it affecting her life? Does she have thoughts that everything is dirty? And what compulsions does she perform? The sterilizing of the silverware and the bringing of her own silverware wherever it is that she goes. Let's look at, um, okay, we're going to get to that. Delusional disorder is basically a non-bizarre delusion of at least one month. Do you have rituals here? Any rituals in delusional disorder? What do you think? Do these people function? Here's a big clue for you. No marked deterioration in their level of functioning. Do you see that in OCD? Is there deterioration? Do they basically stop living? Yes. Phobia is just a fear of something an irrational fear of an object and the need to avoid it. So what would they be afraid of? They would be afraid of things like elevators, heights. Fear of germs is necessarily not a phobia. That's what you would find in OCD. The most common f obsession is the obsession of contamination. But what do the people with OCD do that these people do not? They don't have these rituals that they perform. Okay, so let's treat this woman. Let's decide. What do we do with her? She's there, sitting in front of you. How many of you want to admit her into the hospital? Nobody? You have a lot of empty beds. How many of you want to admit her into the hospital? Even though the administrator would like for you to admit her into the hospital... Does she really meet criteria for hospitalization? Of course not. So what do we do with her? We can treat her as an outpatient basis. So what do we do? We sit down with her. We tell her what she's got. You've got obsessive compulsive disorder. And now we're going to provide treatment. We have to explain everything about it. We, we do inform consent. And what is it that we're going to talk to her about? Medications. Because that's the treatment of choice. What are the medications for? Obsessive compulsive disorder. Is it an anxiety disorder? Yes. What are the drugs used to treat anxiety disorders? The TCAs, the SSRIs, and the MAOIs. However, for OCD, it's a little bit different. Why? Because OCD is linked to serotonin. So what you want to do is you want to use drugs that work on serotonin. And what are those drugs? The SSRIs, the serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors. If we were to choose a tricyclic antidepressant, which is the one that works most on serotonin? Clomipramine. So we're going to talk to her about clomipramine if you want to and about the SSRIs. But what is it that we're going to tell her as far as side effect profile? The SSRIs are better. Why? Because they have less side effects. What are the SSRIs? Let's review them again. Fluoxetine, peroxetine, sertraline, fluvoxamine, and citalopram. I already went over the side effects of the SSRIs, the headaches, the GI problems, the sexual side effects, sedation, agitation, 
sometimes insomnia, what do you want to give her? It doesn't matter. Any SSRI will do. They all work for this, and they're all just as effective. But it's not only medication for her. This is an anxiety disorder, and what kind of therapy did I tell you works really well with anxiety disorders? Behavioral therapy. What is behavioral therapy for her? For her, it's a technique called exposure and response prevention. Don't write this technique down because won't, they won't ask you the name. Just understand it. Let's say she has a problem with contamination. So what would be exposure for her? We take her to a restaurant, preferably some really gross restaurant, where, you know, those restaurants where the windows and the windows are kind of gray or you can see the grease coming down the windows. One of those restaurants. And we make her sit down and we make her eat with the utensils provided in the restaurant and everything that's provided in the restaurant. That's the exposure part. And what do we prevent her from doing? We prevent her from using her own little utensils that she has in her bag. So that's the technique. Exposure and response prevention. And that would be the behavioral therapy that we use for her. How long do we treat patients on anything in anything related to psychiatry? This was asked during one of the breaks. Since most of these disorders have been around for a long time, they just don't occur overnight, how long do you think we need to treat patients? A minimum. Give me a good number. Minimum is what? What? Minimum at least six months to a year. That is true for everything in psychiatry, unless, of course, it's something that just happened. For example, brief psychotic disorder. How quickly does it come and go? Within a month. Do we need to treat that person for a year? No, we treat that patient for a few months. Why? Because the disorder only occurred for one month. The shorter the, the disorder, the less likely that we have to treat for longer periods of time. Unfortunately, there is no book that I can point you to and say, you treat panic disorder for seven months. You treat obsessive compulsive disorder for 11 months. It's not like antibiotic therapy in infectious diseases. That does not occur. This is all subjective. This woman with OCD can be with OCD until she dies. Another woman with OCD can have OCD for five years and the symptoms get better. She gets behavioral therapy and she responds. So it's purely subjective. So you always treat for at least six months to a year. And then that's the point when you start to reduce the dose of the medication. If the patient can tolerate that, what does that mean? That the patient's obviously gotten better. And then you observe them for a little bit longer. And that's standard for everything in psychiatry. Does that make sense? Okay. So you feel comfortable treating OCD? Medication, behavioral, and that's it. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder is the individual who basically, according to psychoanalytic theories, is fixated at what's called the anal stage of development. And if you remember childhood development, what's important about that stage is that it's an issue of control. So these are kids who, according to the theory, get stuck at the anal stage of development. They get fixated at the anal stage of development. So their theme when they're adults is one of control. So they're very controlling, they're very rigid, they're very orderly, they constantly do lists. They constantly, they believe in rules and regulations. They're perfectionistic. They are the perfect lab partner for anybody. Why are they such good lab partners? Because that means you don't have to do any work. Because in their minds, they're the only ones that do things correctly. They're perfectionistic. So in their mind, they're going to say, you know what? Don't do the write-up because I'll do it. Because in their mind, they say, she's going to do it. It's going to be wrong. I'm going to have to correct it. It's going to be wrong. And I'm going to have to do it anyway. So that's like triple, quadruple work. So they're going to volunteer to do anything as far as work is concerned. So that's why you want to look for them when any kind of work assignment is being handed out. So what is the main difference between the personality disorder and the disorder? I like to look at three things. Number one, what is the level of functioning? Compare level of functioning with OCD versus the personality disorder. What do we know about personality disorders? Even though they annoy us, they drive us crazy, do those people basically function? 
yes, they're very annoying, but they do function. They have a job. They've got friends. They do stuff with other people. What about the people with OCD? They're really not functioning. So as far as the level of functioning, you know, the personality disorder will always be much better when you compare it to OCD. Next, I want you to look at duration of symptoms. Personality disorders tend to occur when we're very young. They start to develop around adolescence, but we never label anyone with a personality disorder in adolescence. We typically wait for them to become an adult. But can you see this early on in, the, in their behavior? Of course. What about OCD? Does it occur when you're 12, 13? I mean, it can, but does it typically occur when you're that age? All of the anxiety disorders typically occur when you're in your 20s. By that time, is your personality already set in? So which one has a longer duration? Personality disorders or OCD? Personality disorder also has a longer duration. And the thing about OCD is that they have thoughts all day that they cannot control. And they also have these rituals that they perform. The personality disorder does not have rituals, does not have thoughts. In the personality disorder, you know what? The pointer goes there. Why? I don't need to give you a reason. It's my pointer, and the pointer goes there. If you come along and move the pointer there, that's going to be distressing for me. Why? Because I know it's my pointer. It belongs there. That's the rigidity, the inflexibility of the personality disorder. It's not a thought that they have all day. It's not a ritual that they have to perform, and that's going to be your basic difference. Is that clear? And the treatment of the personality disorder, of course, will be with psychotherapy. What kind of psychotherapy? Individual psychotherapy. And you cross your fingers and hope that it works because those individuals probably will not want to go into therapy. And why is that? Because there's nothing wrong with them. So why should they go into therapy? They'll send you to therapy before they go. So why don't we go on a break here?